Hi, can I get everyone's attention, please? <laughs> okay. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Jerusalem Fund and the Palestine Center, thank you for joining us today. Um, a quick housekeeping note, please just make sure to silence your phones so it doesn't interfere with the talk and everyone can hear and listen. Um, so we are so excited to welcome all of you to our first event of our 2019 summer intern lecture series titled Resist My People, Resist Them, Centering the Voices of Palestinian Women in Resistance. And we picked this title because Resist My People, Resist Them is a poem written by the poet Darin Tatsur, who after writing the poem Resist My People, Resist Them was arrested. Um, and so this is just a small example of the injustice injustices that occur for Palestinian women and the way her voice was used as a form of resistance. Um, so this summer lecture series focuses its attention on the genealogical transformation of Palestinian women's resistance, explores the different forms of resistance that Palestinian women have taken, and draws attention to the varied ways that Palestinian women have been involved with, led, and shaped resistance. So we have planned an exciting lineup of events over the next couple of weeks, and you can find more details on our website, our social media page. We have an Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all that. Um, and we also have some flyers laid out on the table by the front of the door if you're interested. And so as the interns this year, who are all for Palestinian women, which is iconic, and we decided to create a zine and a small brochure that maybe some of you saw, it's by the front of the table. Make sure to check it out on your way there. And it has artwork and different poems that just center Palestinian women. And it's a little way of having this physical symbol of what Palestinian women's resistance looks like. So it is a pleasure to introduce the speaker of our first event this series, Ms. Sandra Tamari. Over the five years since the murder of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Organizing for Palestinian liberation in the United States among Palestinian Americans has developed a stronger commitment to an intersectional analysis that recognizes that no one is free until everyone is free. Gender justice, queer liberation, and racial justice have emerged as important ways to understand the Palestinian struggle for freedom, equality, and justice. Ms. Sandra Tamari will explore how a focus on universal values of freedom and justice are working to embed Palestine into progressive and mainstream discourse. Just a little bit about Ms. Tamari. Uh, Ms. Sandra Tamari is a Palestinian American organizer and the acting director of Adala Justice Project, a Palestinian advocacy organization that highlights the discrimination faced by Palestinian citizens of Israel to illustrate structures of oppression. During the Ferguson uprising in 2014, she worked on building joint liberation efforts between Palestinians and black Americans and remains committed to lifting up other social justice struggles as she works for Palestinian rights. So she will speak around for 40 minutes and then we'll open up the floor to any questions and I'll be walking around with the mic. So just feel free to raise your hand. And then for our online audience, please feel free to tweet us any of your questions at um, the Twitter handle Palestine Center. So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome for Ms. Sandra Tamari. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be invited by young people. So when I first uh, got the invitation from the interns, I thought, wow, OK, <laughs> because it's uh, it's it's the best, you know, to be recognized by um, people who are up and coming, um, because the uh, the people that are here at the back of the room doing all this work are the are the movement, and we're just, you know, uh, kind of clearing the rubble away so that they can they can um, take the path and 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 do the marathon that needs to happen in our movement. Um, it's really a pleasure to be at the Palestine Center. Um, this is a place that is iconic <laughs> in the minds of Palestinians. I, um, I used to live in DC, so this is a place that's familiar to me. I've, I heard all the greats speak here, so to be among that lineup is also a real honor. Um, and it also reminds me um, a lot of a mentor of mine, uh, Dr. Hisham Sharabi, who was one of the founders of the Palestine Center. And I was thinking about him um, you know, as I was coming over here, and I remember I, I worked at Georgetown University at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, and, uh, 
as many of you know, Dr. Sharabi was a, uh, you know, a giant um, in that center and in the founding of Arab Studies here in DC. And 20 years ago, um, it was the 50th anniversary of the Nakba, and a group of students organized uh, an event at the university, and I was an administrator at the center, assistant director. They said, would you be willing to co-sponsor? And without a, without a second thought, I said, sure. <laughs> you got it, you got the room, whatever you need, put, you know, put our names on the flyer, whatever you got. Um, little did I know that, um, well, we should have we should have predicted. But anyway, the the right wing <laughs> um, Israeli um, opposition um, came down hard on the university. We went to the dean's office to complain about our programming, um, and the 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 way that they were uh, they were attacking the event was the use of the word nakba. So that's 20 years ago. So let's just reflect, right? Today, you can go online and you can see BuzzFeed articles about the Nakba, right? You can see Vox um, that's covering the Nakba. So this is all to say that discourse has changed considerably in, 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 tw in, my, in my period of being in the active in this movement. Um, not that discourse is enough, obviously, because last year, 70 years, we had a horrendous day, you know, with the embassy move and the terrible attack on the very brave um, protesters in Gaza. Um, over 70 killed on that day. But discourse changes really are important. And so I wanna you know, think about that with you and think about how do we change discourse and um, celebrate the little wins because if we're not radically optimistic about this movement, then we don't have much that we're gonna be holding on to. Um, anyway, let's give you a little bit of information. I am with the Adala Justice Project. Some of you may be familiar with Adala, the Legal Center for Arab Minority Rights in Israel, based in Haifa. Adala was formed in 1996 to work specifically to do st strategic legal um, litigation in the Israeli courts to highlight the discrimination against Palestinian citizens of Israel. 96 was a period of time uh, post-Oslo where there was a lot of concern among Palestinians of 48 that their issue was going to be sidelined. Two states did not address what was happening inside Israel. Uh, two states did not um, correct the historic injustice of the foundation of the state of Israel and it did not address the Nakba, did not address um, redistribution of land within the state. So 22 years of uh, litigation has shown that we get the Jewish nation state law. Um, so unfortunately, our lawyers are tired <laughs> and, and are not really sure what they should be doing. They continue to fight, they continue to litigate, and they do have litigation that's going to be heard against the nation state law in the future. We don't know. It was supposed to happen in January and now a future date, um, probably after the elections, long after the elections in Israel. So they were, they were thinking a few years ago, what do we do? What do we do if, if litigation is not going to be the answer? The legal system is built against us, just like it's built against many people in this country. Um, can we do advocacy in a new way? And they, they had a young attorney, an American uh, citizen, who was coming back to the US, and she said, let me do some mapping. Let me figure out what we should be doing. So she came to the US and she did that mapping and she went back to them and she said, we should definitely be in the US and we should be everywhere except DC. <laughs> we should not be at the UN, we should not be in Congress, we should be doing grassroots advocacy. And this is how I got introduced to Adala because they showed up in Ferguson um, where I live in St. Louis. So we are using the treatment of Palestinian citizens of Israel as a microcosm of what's happening as a way of illustrating structural racism and making connections to movements in this country that are also fighting structural racism. And we think that this lens helps people understand their own um, situation. We think that it helps them 
be a little bit easier on themselves and not blame themselves when the system is rigged against them. And I, and I hope that through the course of this time that we have together that I can give you a few lessons that we've learned in the last five years. And I can help you um, think about what intersectional means, not in an academic or theoretical way, but at a, at a grassroots level. Because I'm not an academic, I am, uh, I am an organizer, and I really want to speak from my experience, and I hope that we can have a conversation about how this works. So I said we were not going to talk about theory, but we do have a theory of change. <laughs> Our theory of change is um, based on a de-exceptionalizing of Palestine. So I think many of you have heard this idea that there are PEPs, progressive except Palestine, right? So we know about these people. They're, they surround us, liberal Zionists who want to be um, marching against you know, cages at the border and want to be talking about you know, the injustice of the Muslim ban, but at the same time supporting those same policies, right, in Palestine. We have on the other side, um, what are sometimes referred to as poops, which is progressive only on Palestine. And those are some, that's people in my community as a Palestinian, sometimes in the Muslim community, that want to say that Israel is somehow a unique phenomenon in the world, unparalleled um, uh, injustice that's never existed before. I reject that analysis as well, because Israel is a settler colonial state um, that uses white supremacy to subjugate you know, a, you know, a group of people, namely the Palestinians. We've seen this happen. This happens in this country. This happens in Australia, happens in Canada, happens across the globe. And so it's not a unique phenomenon. So we really are trying to say, have coherence. We're talking to the peps, we're talking to the poops, both. Okay? A few years ago, we put together a website um, called Freedom Bound. I invite you to visit it. It's uh, freedom-bound.org um, that really talks about a legacy of solidarity, um, really exploring black Palestinian solidarity through the ages, going back to the 1960s and really um, exploring how those things have uh, manifested again and again as political choices through the decades. Um, and there are many lessons that we've gleaned, and we do have a, you know, we have about 10 lessons on the website that you can explore. But today, I, I was hoping I you would let me indulge you in four of those lessons, and we can talk a little bit about how those have manifested in some of the organizing I've done. Um, the first lesson is show up. Pretty simple, right? Um, we, we have many examples in the past of, you know, um, members of the Black Panthers, SNCC, you know, traveling to Tunis and uh, having exchanges with the PLO, um, really um, basing their analysis of racism in this country in an international um, analysis of what was happening, um, and, and Palestinians becoming a model of resistance, right? Um, in the more recent period, what we have seen in really beginning in Ferguson and, go and really going back even to Trayvon Martin in Florida with the, the rise of the Dream Defenders and the fact that the Dream Defenders was founded by, co-founded by a Palestinian, Ahmed Abu Zneid, we really saw that the, there was a, a lot of um, showing up, Palestinians showing up for the black struggle um, and making connections with police brutality in this country. Um, in the Ferguson moment was something that changed my life forever. So we're coming into August. This year will be five years since the murder of Mike Brown on that August 9th. Um, it was a, you know, a, a very hot uh, Saturday, and I was sitting at home reading these, the Twitter feed of this young man in the street. As we all know the story, four and a half hours in the sun, his mother unable to reach him. And it was that summer, that same summer of uh, terrible violence in Gaza and the kidnapping of you know, a child in Jerusalem, burned alive. So it wasn't just theoretical in my mind. As a mom, it was, this, it was a very uh, visceral sorrow that I was feeling in my heart. And so the first impulse that many Palestinians that I was active with was, we must send a letter to Michael Brown's mother. 
we must get to her somehow and express our sorrow. And, you know, it was a good impulse, but we learned quickly that it wasn't addressing the issues that the Ferguson, the Ferguson community was asking us to do. What they were asking us to do was show up in the streets and to occupy the police department and to, um, to be brave, right? It wasn't about an individual act and that we had to address the structure of racism that allowed this murder to happen and allowed the person that did this to you know, be let go. So I want to go then to a, one year after the murder of Mike Brown. Um, we, we got a note that there, were, there was a delegation coming to visit us. Um, I didn't know much about who was coming. Um, and very last moment, I had three people in my home. <laughs> and we, we went to the, um, the march for Mike Brown together. Um, one of these people was uh, Siam Nawara. Some of you may know Siam. Siam is a Palestinian uh, father um, from Ramallah whose uh, son Nadim was murdered by snipers on Nakba Day in 2014, three months before the murder of Mike Brown. Um, Siam is a brilliant person. Um, he used forensic video. Um, he analyzed the video of the, of the attack of the sniper shot against his son. And he was able to identify through social media the individual that shot his son and took this to court. And um, when he came to St. Louis, he was on a tour looking for answers and trying to get justice for Nadim. And a group of people decided that he needed to come to St. Louis to try to make connections and to meet the family of Mike Brown and meet the family of Von Derrick Myers, another young man who was shot in that same summer um, by police in St. Louis. And when I first met CM and tried to explain to him what was going on and who Mike Brown was and what, you know, why there was an uprising and what was happening, he was very resistant. He did not want to hear about it. His, he had a single mission, justice for Nadim. Um, but I want to I want to show you a short video that a film a really talented filmmaker made of this visit, and um, show you where where uh, CM ended up um, by the end of this you know three days intense three days. Revolution. We pray, oh God, that we might co-labor with you in the earth, that we might bring a day, an end to the day where every other day our children are shot down in the street. And God, until then, we swear with our very lives, we will resist. استشهد في ذكرى النكبة السنة الماضية بدون أي سبب يذكر إنه استشهد. أنا هون هلا في سان لويس عشان أناصر أهالي ناس استشهدوا بنفس الطريقة ما استشهد فيها ابني يعني قتلوا ظلم بدون أي سبب. فلسطيني 
جاي تقدروا هذا الموقف قدروا اني انا اجيت لمناصرتهم لدعمهم للوقوف معهم للاحساس معهم فعشان احنا بدنا الناس تحس فينا لازم نحس مع الناس شعرت في الناس اللي هون كيف عم بيخسروا اولادهم زي ما احنا بفلسطين بنخسر اولادنا نفس النظام اللي بيستعمل معهم بيستعمل معنا So you can see, you know, CM had a transformation with our in our short time together. Six oh five freeway. And oh you yeah, can see quite. there uh, going <laughs> right through that red light. Uh, such Absolutely. a dangerous situation. <laughs> So uh, we spent a lot of time uh, late in the evenings, you know, showing CM. Um, he was he was into video forensics, so he was shocked when we showed him videos of police shootings in this country. And he said, the evidence is there. You see it happening, and there's no justice. And so through hearing these stories and meeting the families and having the reaction, you can see, you know, people like Cornell West and Bree, Bree um, you know, hugging him and, and comforting him. The showing up became an act of solidarity, right? That he was there meant a lot to them. They didn't know where he was, right? They thought he was there to, to be there for them. Um, and they, they reciprocated that, that solidarity. So it was a really powerful moment of time. And I think that Palestinians living in Ferguson uh, felt that over and over again. Um, and we can talk more about how that happens in different contexts. Lesson two, right? Um, share strategies. So there's a, you know, there are a lot of examples. This is w one of the, you know, the Freedom Riders, right? We re we remember, of course, the Freedom Riders uh, of the of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, Palestinians, you know, borrowed this mo this uh, this tactic, right, and this narrative to talk about segregated roads and settlements inside the West Bank. Um, and it was a powerful action. This is the more famous one, right? These are tweets that were coming into Ferguson from uh, people in the West Bank that were talking about how to deal with tear gas. So um, we have people like Meriam Barghouti and others who were sending uh, people, you know, um, really practical ways of dealing with this, you know, this phenomenon that they had not dealt with before. Don't rub your eyes. Bring milk of magnesia to the, to the protest. Um, you know, run, run against, you know, away from the, from the wind and, and, and different, you know, very practical things. And it was heard, right? It was heard in, in a very powerful way. And this is usually when you talk to people about how did Palestine become embedded in the Ferguson movement, they refer to these tweets. And so this is a really important, um, you know, moment of solidarity, the sharing of strategy. And you know, this continues, right? There are lots of ways that we share strategies. At Adala, we look to US law. We look to Jim Crow era um, to make arguments in the Israeli courts. Um, lots of, you know, different times when they're looking to me and asking, are there any, is there any research? What's the research on <laughs> different kinds of, you know, legal strategies that have happened in the US? Uh, working with partners like the Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, to try to think about, you know, strategies and arguments that can be made in the Israeli courts because the Israeli courts like to think of themselves as liberal. The judges like to remove themselves, right, from the, the state and say that they're this, you know, this body. And if you, I don't know if anyone has been to law school, any lawyers? Anyway, m yeah. My understanding is that, you know, a lot of the textbooks, the law textbooks really, uh, 
you know, use a lot of Israeli case law. Um, uh, so as a way of saying, you know, th look at this, you know, independent judici I'm sorry, judiciary and how, you know, out front they are. Um, but, you know, the reality, we know the reality of this, right? And obviously it it's has its rightward trend just like, you know, in this country. You know, this is another, um, you know, another way that sharing strategies had impact. Uh, Sherelle Brown, who was one, was a Dream Defender and the first Dream Defender delegation to Palestine in January 2015, um, wrote in an article um, about talking to someone um, in the Ferguson protest that had a Palestinian flag. And she was asking him, you know, why do you have this flag? And he said, um, well, I don't know. All I know is that these are the people on Twitter telling me how to survive tear gas. So I got their flag out here. So it's really, you know, that's great. We'll take it. <laughs> okay. Uh, lesson three, um, study. Um, sharing strategies, but also sharing um, intellect. Um, this is a picture of Audre Lorde, and Audre Lorde has had a huge impact on Palestinian feminism um, and feminism across the globe. Um, so, you know, waking up to the idea that Palestinian feminism um, must be grounded in an anti-colonial framework that it's not simply a feminism that's against masculinity or against men, because it's not only men um, in Israel that are oppressing them, right? It's the whole system that's oppressing them. So, you know, this is an important, you know, reminder that, uh, you know, reading outside of our movements is very important. Um, this is one of the ways that Adala does its work here in the U.S. We like to, um, when we say de-exceptionalize Palestine, we also want Palestine to be embedded in different conversations. So coming to the Palestine Center is nice, you all are great, but you know these issues and you're all with me, right? <laughs> but I, for instance, um, like to go to different settings and we like to set up conversations that maybe don't happen all the time. So one example, and there's some, at least one person from New Orleans, so I don't think you were at this meeting, but you know, we, we set up a, a, a conversation with housing advocates in New Orleans, right? Um, we, we invited them in saying we're going to have lunch, we're going to host this at a, you know, a place that's, you know, known to all of you at a housing advocate, you know, uh, office, and uh, we want everyone to come in and we want to strategize with you. And what we did is we created a space of co-education. We refer to this as co-education. We presented um, for a very short time about housing policies in Israel, about Admissions committees. Admissions committees are committees in, in, in small towns, over 500 towns inside Israel, that are set up to interview potential residents. And these uh, admissions committees can create their own rules. They can decide who is socially suitable to live inside that community. So while the law that allows these uh, admissions committees never says this is used to discriminate against Palestinians. It does, because many of these communities say, just say simply, we're a Zionist community. We're a communi community that's committed to Zionism. And so the first question that a Palestinian applicant will have is, are you a Zionist? And Palestinians, by definition, are not Zionist, in case you were wondering. <laughs> or they will have uh, a stipulation that, that requires military service. Um, to be a, a resident of that community. And Palestinians do not serve in the military because they're seen as a fifth column inside of Israel, right? So they're, they're exempted from, from military service. Um, so we began to describe these, uh, these tactics, these laws, and the New Orleans uh, housing advocates were, we know that, we've heard of this before. This is exactly how it works here. So they, they began to explain to us about housing covenants that had been passed after Katrina that uh, stated very specifically um, in one instance uh, that uh, for a landowner to rent to a tenant, that tenant had to be a blood relation within two or three degrees. And what that meant is that white, <laughs> white landowners, which were the majority, the vast majority, um, could only rent to relations who are also white. So this was segregation by another name, right? And so they were, they were all of a sudden, Palestine that seemed so far away from them and so distant 
became an issue that they understood and was connected to their own issues. And so this was a very powerful two hours of, of conversation about how Palestine is not um, an exception and not far away, but really connected to their own issues. And so this is the kind of thing that we like to you know, curate. Okay, lesson four, centering native history. Um, this is an artistic depiction of Mahmoud Darwish, who many of you know. Um, and the poem, which you can't read, is written by Lee Maracle, who is an indigenous uh, poet from Canada. Um, and um, she met uh, Mahmoud Darwish at an international conference. And the quote, if I'm remembering it correctly, was that something inside Mahmoud Darwish spoke deeply to her when she met him. And it was this you know, understanding, this seeing of each other as indigenous people uh, displaced. Um, and Adala Justice Project really does try to ground our work in an understanding of settler colonialism and our own complicity of, of in settler colonialism on this land. Um, it's m my, you know, I should have acknowledged the land. We are in Pisc um, Piscataway? Piscataway land. Um, and it's important for us to remember that we also are complicit in this. So as we, as we are fighting Israeli settler colonialism, we have to be consistent and coherent and talk about our own complicity in that. Even we Palestinians and other immigrants, um, we are settler, you know, you know, we are also settlers, immigrant settlers. You know, this, this map is the one that we are always showing at our events, right? And this is an important map. But the map that we don't talk about is this one, right? And this is not what we're taught in school, and this is not what our movement is talking about. And we absolutely have to talk about the loss of native land if we want to be consistent. And we are, you know, uh, partnering with indigenous, you know, organizations like the Red Nation. We are partnering with organizations that are fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, many Palestinians went to Standing Rock. Um, the pipeline continues to be built. Um, it's going across the country, and it's uh, it's ending up in the Louisiana Bayou, and in the Louisiana Bayou. Um, the map of that pipeline is going through unincorporated towns. Unincorporated towns meaning towns that are not you know, re recognized, not on the maps, not on the GPS. And this is a way of erasing native and black communities, poor communities. The very same way that Israel erases Bedouin vi uh, villages in the Nakab. So th there's a lot to learn from one another and that you know, it's important for us to continue to keep this in mind as we go forward. Just, ex just examples of, of Palestinians showing up for, for native struggle. So I want to go back, you know, to the title that I chose for this, um, for this uh, talk and, and we are, we are not free. None of us are free until everyone is free. It goes back to Fannie Lou Hamer, um, civil rights icon, um, really pushed to have, you know, make sure that women, black women, were represented in the political process and fought for voting rights. And, you know, remembering that black women have been taking great risk in this country and have been taking great risk for our movement, for Palestinian movement. And I just want to lift up um, the, the women of the Dream Defenders, the women of the Highlander Center, um, the women in St. Louis that have continued to, to lift up our movement and to make it you know, very strong. Um, it's been an honor to be side by side with these people and to struggle with them and try to show up, try to share, try to study. Um, and to remind ourselves of our complicity in these, uh, in these systems. Um, I've learned a lot. I've been transformed in the last five years. And I, I'm excited about the discourse changes that are happening, going back to what I was saying. You know, um, 
Five years ago, there wasn't a conversation about reparations happening in this country. And now presidential candidates are being forced to have a policy position on, on reparations. Um, we, we did not have conversations about prison abolition. And it's people like Angela Davis and the movement that have made that a central um, piece. We are relying on our partners in the movement for black lives and other social justice movements to make sure that Palestine becomes part of the progressive movements in the US, that Palestine's not left behind. And they are committed to that. And I, I'm always humbled when I ask for their help and they're willing to take us on and willing to put their issues aside. Uh, one of the things that I uh, learned in Ferguson is that when Palestine does get embedded, and I, I think many of you know this, it takes over. The conversation becomes all about us, becomes all about the opposition and the backlash. Um, what, I, what I kept doing of, often was apologizing for how much space you know, my issue was taking. And the biggest gift I was ever given by a black activist that I'm very close with in St. Louis is never apologize for being here. That your issue is central, is important to us. We need an international um, asp you know, perspective on these issues. Otherwise, we think that we're alone. And so the last story I'll tell you is that on Sunday night, I was at the church of um, Reverend Graylin Hag Hagler um, in uh, Northeast St. Louis, I mean, sorry, <laughs> Northeast <laughs> DC, um, for the counter Kufi um, action. And um, there was a beautiful um, choir that's, that sang at that event. I was really moved. Um, a really beautiful um, singer, tall black woman, um, sang the verse of We Shall Overcome. She sang it, um, We Are Not Afraid. And I was moved to tears that that song was being offered to the Palestine Liberation Movement. And I went up to her afterwards and I thanked her for her voice and for her presence. And what she told me was that um, she was there to honor her daughter who had passed away two years ago. Um, her daughter who worked for the American Friends Service Committee in Africa um, died two years ago and, and just before her death, she had returned a camera that had belonged to her mother. Her mother left this camera behind at Busboys and Poets and was you know, just distraught that she had lost this camera. Um, six weeks later, after her daughter had passed away and she thought the camera had been gone forever, um, a Palestinian called her and said, I've been looking for you. I have your camera. And she was so moved by this. And so they met up and this Palestinian told her, I'm here to protest APAC. And you know, that's why I'm here. And I wanted to make sure you got this back. And she was, you know, she said, I'm going with you. I'll go to the White House with you. I'm going to protest APAC too. And um, Sunday night was her daughter's birthday. And so she felt like the only place she, need she needed to be in a, in a space for Palestine. And so these are, these are the moments of showing up. These are the moments and the gifts of solidarity. And this is what gives us meaning. This is what gives us hope. We have to remain hopeful. We have to remain optimistic because if we're going to win, which I believe we will, we have to remain joyful. So thank you all for all the work you're doing. I appreciate you. Okay, we're just gonna open it up for any Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, just raise your hand so I can see you and I'll bring the mic over. Any questions? Oh. Hi there. Um, so I guess my question is, have you, has anyone in the organization thought about kind of expanding the scope to other countries? So for example, the most milita militarized um, land in the country in all the world is Kashmir. And it's interesting, there's a lot of parallels between Kashmir and Palestine, especially 
because it was by the British all this happened, and it happened within a year or two of each other with the Nakba and the partition. So I mean, it's just an example of parallels that could be found. So I'm just curious, has there been any thought to expand this kind of scope and activism? I mean, I think we're always looking for new analysis, right? I mean, it's important for us to not only be consistent you know, within these borders, but also to be thinking about um, what's happening around the globe. We are pushing forward for, I mean, the way that we do our messaging is that if you as a progressive believe in human rights, you believe in equality, you believe everyone should be free, then this is how it applies to the, the issue of Palestine. Um, but it doesn't mean that it stops there, right? It's a case study, right? We want progressives to be thinking about many issues. We want them to be thinking about um, what happens to Iraqi refugees. We want them to be thinking about Yemen and, and the way that Saudi Arabia is complicit. Um, and Kashmir, obviously, is a very important parallel. Um, I, I and one halftime person run this project. <laughs> um, and so we're, we have a lot. Um, but I do think that our movements could, can learn a lot about um, you know, how to approach these issues through um, an analysis of other issues like Kashmir. It's an important uh, place of um, potential solidarity. So I'm, I'm open to that, and maybe we can have a mo more of a conversation after this about that. That would be great. Just a little comment. Um, August 9th, 2015 was also the 70th anniversary of the U.S. atomic bombing of Nagasaki, mm. which is another manifestation of that. And I was in Hiroshima, Nagasaki for the 60th anniversary, and they were singing We Shall Overcome mm. there as well. And um, whenever we sing the verse, we, shall, we are not afraid, I never sing that verse because it's not about not being afraid, but it's not being controlled by fear and that people who are courageous act in spite of their fear. So you don't sing it, um, why? Could you say it again? Because it's not true, I, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think it's, there's reason to be afraid. The issue is not to let yourself be controlled by fear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I hear it as a prayer almost. Uh -huh. Like we, we aspire to not be afraid in some ways. Mm -hmm. I don't know how others hear it, but that's the way I hear it. It's an mm -hmm. aspiration. I think it's great that you guys aren't in D.C. <laughs> or in Washington, I think you meant to say. But yeah. here in D.C., we actually have a project trying to get our cops not to train in Israel because we think, and when I'm tabling, which I do <laughs> regularly, as do my people over here, um, I always say I don't want my community treated the way the Palestinians get treated, both by our cops and the parallels between them. And it's, a, it's something that really resonates uh, with people here in D.C. as opposed to Washington over there. Uh, so I'm so I, I wrote down your uh, website. I'm really looking forward to s sharing it. It's also notable that almost that three quarters of the DC people who came to yesterday's demonstration against Christians United for Israel mm -hmm. were from this campaign that aims to get DC cops from training in Israel because once you see the parallel, it just all can't go back. Thank you so much. It gives us feel like I got some backup as I provided backup to y'all yesterday. Oh, thank you. Thank you. No, I mean, props to the D.C. folks that have been running really the most successful deadly exchange program in the country right now. Um, really active and really important. Um, are people familiar with deadly exchange? Um, Jewish Voice for Peace has, you know, started this campaign to end, you know, uh, military and, and police exchanges between Israel and the United States. Um, the chief of police of St. Louis County um, was one of the trainees um, on th one of the programs that went to Israel, um, and they're and they're learning, you know, all the tactics. Um, we saw those tactics in Ferguson. Um, we're seeing more and more militarization of our policing. Um, not to say that the police weren't um, already violent and weren't an issue before those training that training happened, but definitely that's a sharing of strategy that we don't encourage. <laughs> Uh, so in the very tight-knit Jewish community that I grew up in, there was this idea that anti-Zionism is synonymous with anti-Semitism. I'm sure you're familiar with this argument. Um, so wh what would you say is a good rebuttal to that when I'm speaking to my fellow Jewish students at my school who, who make this claim? Yeah. I always answer this question as a Palestinian saying that, you know, 
that presumes that Palestinians wouldn't resist um, their subjugation if it wasn't Jews. Like, would we, you know, if it was another group of people, do you think that Palestinians would be like, okay, yeah, we're fine with this subjugation, we're okay with this violence? I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty absurd to think that, right? Um, Palestinians are, are going to, would, would be resisting regardless of who their occupier is. Um, unfortunately, Edward Said said this, um, that we have the unfortunate fate of being the victim of Europe's victims, right? So we, you know, we have, a, we have that conundrum that we are not, e not even allowed the, the legitimacy of our resistance. Um, you know, it's, it's, it works, that's why people use this tactic and use this, um, this ploy. I mean, um, somebody was telling me that, you know, one of John Hagee's uh, points yesterday, I haven't been following everything he said, I can't believe I missed out. <laughs> um, it was, you know, that, you know, they also, they're conflating, um, you know, BDS and, and Palestinian resistance to anti-Semitism. While, you know, and, and people are clapping for him and the Israeli officials that were there are, 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 are praising him for that, ignoring the real anti-Semitism coming from Hagee's own mouth, right? Mm -hmm. You know, calling, you know, I learned so much about, you know, saying that Hitler is a hunter, was a hunter. And, and using that uh, biblical reference to justify, you know, the Holocaust, and somehow he is the savior of the Jewish people. I mean, it's it's absurd because it scares me. This, you know, this conflation scares me not only for me and my resistance and my people, but it scares me for Jewish people. I mean, it's like we we it becomes everyone becomes less safe when these this kind of conflation is allowed to persist. Uh, so I work uh, at the Institute for Palestine Studies here in D.C., and I just want to let everybody know that the upcoming issue of the Journal of Palestine Studies will be a special issue focused on black Palestinian transnational solidarities. It's going to feature work by Nora Arakat and Mark Lamont Hill, who was actually in uh, that video before. Um, and I also have a, a question. Um, you, you mentioned the changes in discourse, and I think one of the effects of that has been changes within the uh, platform the, of the Democratic Party mm -hmm. on Palestine. Uh, just yesterday, two people from the group If Not Now talked to Elizabeth Warren and got her to agree to put pressure on Israel to end the occupation. I'm wondering if, if yeah, it is pretty great, but she, of course she came under fire right away for acknowledging the occupation <laughs> itself. So um, I'm curious if you might have any advice for ways for people to engage uh, specifically the nominees uh, for the Demo or the, uh, the people for the Demo Democratic Party running for president, how we can put pressure on them to make a change. Yeah, yeah. So you know, with all the uh, the caveats that I'm not a lobbyist and <laughs> I do some advocacy, <laughs> but the the you know the main thing is that we we sh we we find them right. If you have access to these candidates, if you go to the town halls, you know, let's make sure that we're asking really smart questions, right? Um, Let's you know not give them an easy out. Like you know, I was I was saying to someone, oh, it's important that we you know we, we talk about the Jewish nation state law, for instance, um, you know, and, and and ask them what they think of it. And, and you know, someone said, well, that's not a good question because what in the end they're going to say, oh, but I support Israel in a two state solution. So don't give them the easy out. So the question has to be much more. You know, you create a narrative. You make sure that there's a story around your question so that at least you're story is getting heard, right? We've seen this done in really um, great ways. There's a woman, I think, up in New Hampshire who's been doing this, a Palestinian woman who's been doing this brilliantly. Um, and, you know, making sure that her points are heard. And then it doesn't really matter what the candidate says afterwards because then <laughs> already our, our talking points are out there in the ether, right? Um, I think that we, we have to totally, um, you know, call them out. I think we start, I mean, I, the way that I like to approach things is that you praise them for their good policies, right? You say, oh my goodness, thank you. Thank you for standing firm, you know, that you know, children should not be in cages you know, on the border. Um, what do you think? Do you think that that's a universal principle? You know, and how does that apply um, in the case of you know, Israel's detention of children? Um, that's an obvious example. But there are lots of ways that we can you know, um, you know, force people to be coherent or at least you know, embarrass them when they're not. Um, so I think that that's a, an important thing. Um, the platform will be interesting, but I think the more important thing is gonna be you know, the questions at the debates, 
the kinds of grassroots pressure that's put on them, the, the bird dogging that um, people will be doing um, you know, in the Midwest, usually that's hap the way it, it works. So I'm excited about, because we have, I mean, I was leaving the counter Kufi um, uh, demo yesterday at the convention center, and I was really frustrated because there were two black men on the, on the train with me and they were wearing the Kufi badges and I, you know, I just said, you know, I have to ask you a question. You know, what are you doing inside that racist conference? It's really awful. And we had a very brief exchange because I was getting off on the next stop. And, you know, they had said, well, you know, they were insistent it was not racist and it was, you know, Israel was, you know, theologically sound. And, you know, so we didn't get very far. <laughs> um, but as I was getting off the train, a woman and her teenage son followed me off. And they were like, oh, did you say you're Palestinian? And I said, yes. And they were like, she said, my son tried to organize um, a Palestinian advocacy, you know, human rights group inside his you know, um, high school in Maryland and got so much pushback. And we're having a hard time figuring out how to do this. So of course I was like, all right, well, there is hope. Here's my card, let's talk. <laughs> but you know, okay, we'll leave these you know, th th some of these people aside, but we've got, you know, so much going for us. I mean, you know, when you have a high schooler that's willing to stand up to bullies and pressure and that kind of backlash, then I'm not, I'm not fearful. I'm not worried about our future. I think that these candidates are gonna be playing catch up and, you know, they're, they're gonna be left behind. We have a generation, they have a generation, they're on, they're on notice in, in my opinion. Thank you so much to the uh, Palestinian Center. It is such an education that we get when we come here. Thank you for your talk, very informative. I, if I may add a little bit on the positive side of what you said uh, internationally, you know that the deepest and most extensive solidarity with the Palestinian struggle comes from Latin America, mm -hmm. both at the street level, mm -hmm. I'm talking of thousands of people in the streets uh, all over, and also at the official level, mainly now that many leftist uh, governments have been uh, pushed back by the US through money, extortion, threat, violence, death, the usual American behavior. Mm -hmm. But uh, see, in, th in that sense, now uh, at the official level, you have mainly always the first one who wrote a book on, on, on Palestine and the Middle East struggle was Fidel Castro, <laughs> Cuba at the head. Second, Venezuela, which the U.S. is trying to destroy because it's beginning to become a bother. It's stopping the U.S. from getting into to get the oil, you know. Mm. And third, Bolivia, my country. Mm. To give you an example about Bolivia and the women and the, and the living conditions that you mentioned, yesterday, the People's Assembly, which is 46% uh, women, I mean 54% 50, women, the People's Assembly, uh, managed for the President Morales to issue a decree, which is a law actually, based on the people's desires, mm -hmm. where every single mother with more than two children, with more than, sorry, more than one children will get free living conditions, free housing forever. Mm -hmm. And the size of the house will be according to how many children she has. This is just to give you an idea of the progressive pe uh, governments and peoples that are supporting fully the Palestinian struggle. Now, second positive thing. I think that the Palestinian struggle and the similar struggles to the United States behavior. I mentioned the US, but I think with Israel, the US is the main stakeholder in this uh, sinful behavior that Israel and the US are having. The positive side is that the peoples of the world with the new communications that we have are beginning to realize, including the American people, that the United States is not what the leaders always said. <laughs> the people are beginning to dismount the big historic lies about the United States. Words, like in the original documents, we the people, a lie. <laughs> Democracy, a lie. <laughs> Freedom, a lie. When we have in reality, a financial, greedy, capitalist, that's the word, elite in Wall Street controlling the country through legalized corruption by the Supreme Court. Yeah. You know, big corporations can buy politicians, buy uh, candidates. 
uh, total corruption, but it's legal, very smart. You know? So I want to thank you because that will push people to try to question more one of the main stakers here in, the, in this struggle of the Palestinian people, the United States. The United States must be denounced, not the people, but this Wall Street elite that tries to control the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, first of all, thank you so much. I've learned a really lot tonight. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear what you think about um, another really important area of, for progressive struggle is the climate issue. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what your thoughts on, on how the climate movement and the Palestine human rights movement can, c could support one another, and what, what do you see as the relationship between those two being, or potentially being? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there are two parts to that. I mean, the impact is one part of it. The impact on Palestinians is gonna be grave, right? We're already seeing the water crisis. Um, you know, elites and Israeli, you know, these elites in Israel are going to be fine. Um, they're going to figure out a way to hoard the resources and make sure, you know, that it doesn't flow to Palestinian communities. Um, and so that's one side of it. But the other side, I think, is, you know, how do we join forces, right, with climate um, activists here in this country, with the environmental movement? I think that it's absolutely imperative because it is gaining strength, and I think that um, it's just... <laughs> It is the issue. It is the issue that's going to impact all of us. You know, it, it doesn't really matter what happens to the land if there's nothing left of it, right? Um, so I think that it's really important for us to think about, you know, the use of tactics, right? So I think the environmental movement learned a lot, I think, from Palestinian activists with their divestment campaigns on campuses. Um, you know, it was Palestine that, that set that course, right? And so now you see, um, you know, joint divestment campaigns with prison abolitionist and environmental activist mm -hmm. and, and Palestine activist. And usually there's intersection of all those companies that they're talking about. Because the reality is that these companies are terrible not only because they run prisons in Palestine or because they are building you know, infrastructure um, in the West Bank, they're also terrible because they're doing <laughs> you know, terrible things here and terrible things around the globe. Um, in St. Louis, we we ran a very successful campa campaign um, nine years ago. In 2010, we won um, against Veolia, which is a water management company. Um, they were bidding on a contract to privatize water in the city of St. Louis. Um, and, and it was Palestine activists that brought this to the attention of the environmental m movement in St. Louis and to the labor movement. And so the coalition that formed around this was, you know, labor, um, the you know, Missouri uh, you know, Organization for the Environment, the Sierra Club, um, all of us working to make sure that this contract was blocked. It was a nine-month campaign. Um, we adopted, you know, coalition building is difficult. A lot of people were uncomfortable with the Palestine portion of it. But we, we came up with agreements that we wouldn't undermine one another. Um, but it was the Palestine movement that brought people out. I mean, every week there was a hearing in the um, mayor's office in the city hall about appropriations for this contract. And it was, you know, it was a majority of Palestine uh, folks that was showing up to line the halls of, you know, of city hall and make it very clear that we wanted to save the water. That was our, that was our tagline, save water, save the water. And, and, but Palestine was a major talking point throughout. Why are these Palestinians here? Why are the Palestine activists here? You had to have that conversation. But in the end, you know, what we were able to do was, you know, make this about the, it was about the environment in the, in the end. And, and we stayed committed to that, um, even when Veolia was, was kicked out. We got Veolia to pull their contract. They were so embarrassed by the media. The mayor, till the end, wanted that contract. Um, but we were able to get them to pull their bid because they were like, we can't, it's not worth it, you know, a uh, few million dollars for all this bad publicity. And then, you know, luckily, um, Veolia pulled out of Israel a few years later. So, you know, we can, 
This is an example. It's not obviously Veolia is not the whole environmental problem, but it, we ended up seeing them. They, their name came up in the Flint water crisis. So you know, all of these things. It's profit. It's profit that is driving these terrible, terrible policies, and that's why um, Israel continues to have all this support. I mean, we have to remember that you know, Israel is not just uh, an outpost, right, of you know U.S. imperialism and a way for us to, you know, control the region. It also, there's a lot of people making a lot of money off that military. You know, Israel is one of the largest exporters of drones in the whole world. Why? You know, how do they have that market? You know, so we have to be constantly, you know, thinking about the connections. And so I, I appreciate that question. I want to, you know, for all of us to be thinking deeper about how we can, you know, share strategies and be and be smart about our advocacy. Okay, I think this is going to be the last question. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Eliza, and I'm interning with the Mennonite Central Community uh, Mennonite Central Committee this summer. Um, and one of our focus issues has been Israel Palestine. Um, and I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania, um, a community that was very white, very middle class, very Christian, mm -hmm. very privileged in many regards. And so growing up, I never heard about really anything in regards to the Middle East um, because it's not something that's in our dialogue. And so I, I went to a public state university and now I'm interning here and it's become such an important part of my life. And I go back to my small town and I tell people about it and they go, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's nice, but that's across the world, that doesn't affect us. Mm -hmm. that, like, we're not focused on that. What strategies do you employ to first make people aware of what's going on and then secondly, get people who say, well, that doesn't impact us mm -hmm. to feel impacted and feel motivated to advocate and to stand in solidarity? It's great. I mean, at least you're starting at a point where they say it doesn't matter. They don't have ideological, like, barriers, right, to being engaged. So I think you're actually in a good place because many of us are dealing with <laughs> communities that have ideological barriers and have already like a, yeah, a hatred, right, for Palestinians. So good on you. <laughs> so where do you go from there, right? Um, I, I think you meet people where they are. So what are they engaged in? Like what are the issues that they're, they're focused on? Um, are they worried about the economy? Are they worried about housing? Are they worried about the environment? I mean, I think that the very, s the most simple thing that we can do is to make sure that people understand how much money the U.S. is sending to Israel each year. You know, we can be investing that money at home. We can be bringing, you know, all of that um, money to rebuilding infrastructure, to be providing, you know, really quality preschool education for children, to be providing um, assistance for childcare. Um, there's no reason why this country has to be in the situation it's in. Um, but it's, you know, obviously that's not the only thing, but it is, it is a, a beginning of a conversation that you can, you can begin to have, to have, you know, that bring the money home. You know, there's no reason for our, you know, for militarization to be the priority of our budgets. So that's how I would start it. And then, you know, obviously see where that conversation goes, but always meeting people where they are. Um, and helping move them along has been, I think, a strategy that works. Okay, thank you so much to Ms. Sandra Tamari. Can we just give her one more round of applause? Thank you. thank you so much for joining us today. And please remember to check out the flyers and zines on the booth. And thank you. Have a great night. Thank you.